Well, we've been in a series over the past number of weeks called Manifest, in which we've been exploring a letter that John wrote, and it's a short letter, uh, but it's a letter that's very pastoral. He's writing as a pastor, and, and it's very much like a Thanksgiving Day conversation, you know, around the table. Uh, whether, you know, it was turkey or, you know, people, if you don't like turkey, I guess you go with chicken or ham or something like that. But anyways, you know how those conversations go where a topic emerges and then maybe kind of goes underwater for a little bit to later on emerge again and kind of cycles back around. Well, that's very much the way that John writes, where he will address a topic and then he kind of backs away from it a little bit, but then he brings it back again, and he backs away from it, and then he brings it back again. Well, we've seen this a number of times. As you read through the letter, it's a short letter. Uh, it only takes a few minutes to read through, but as you're reading through, you get that sense of these themes keep popping up. And, and like, for example, to be alert, to be alert to watch for those opportunities to serve one another out of a heart of love. I mean, any number of times John has said, by this we prove that we're following after Jesus, by the way that we show our love to one another, by the way we serve one another. And, and there's that sense of, uh, in our serving, of, in love of one another, that God is at work in the midst of that, and it's, and it's awaiting that day that, well, I love this verse from 1 John chapter 3 where uh, as with each action we take, we reflect God's work in us. And looking forward to that day John spoke of when in 1 John 3, 2, he says, Beloved, we are God's children now. Okay, when are we God's children? Now. Okay, we are God's children now. In other words, live like kids of the king because you are kids of the king. We are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Wow. That, that those acts of service in love will one day be manifest fully and freely, and we will be able to see you know, all those things that, oh man, did they really appreciate what I did? Does it make any difference? Does it, does it really help? Does it, does it encourage them? Does it build them up? And you say, yes, it did. Wow. Wow. We're looking forward to that day. So we're alert for those opportunities to serve one another in love. We're alert for other things too, some not so positive, if you will, like for example, alert for false pictures of Jesus. Apparently, there were some people connected with the churches that John was writing to that would hold up a picture of Jesus other than what we read about in the Gospels, other than what John had spoken to them about. And so they were holding up these, these false pictures of Jesus and saying, well, this is the truth. This is the truth. Uh, like, for example, one of the teachings that, that might have been happening at that time was that, well, you know, Jesus, he was here physically, but, you know, the spirit of Christ was not there on the cross. It was this convoluted philosophy that was going on that was causing people to trip over themselves. Like, well, okay, so who is Jesus? What did he accomplish, really? Uh, on our behalf. What, what is all this about? And John says, be alert for those false pictures. And, and that's part of the context in which John is writing this letter, not only to admonish, that is, encourage followers of Jesus to serve one another in love, but also to be aware of those who would try to pull them away with a false message. And he expands on that theme of alertness in the passage that Barb read for us earlier in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, if you read through verses 1 through 6 again, there's only two commands that John gives. That is, two imperatives, that's the technical term, uh, that is, to-dos, things you're supposed to do with what you have heard. 
Uh, so the first thing is, one of the first things he said to do is do not believe every spirit that is teaching or the teachers that are bringing that, uh, that message. Um, don't believe every spirit you hear because there are those who are trying to deceive you. That's what he said back in chapter 2. He said there are people intentionally saying, uh, okay, you've heard about this Jesus, but this is the real Jesus over here. And, and they're trying to distract you. So be alert. Do not listen to everybody who comes along. But secondly, test to see if these teachings are truly from God. Put them to the test. If somebody comes along with a message, you, you know, ask them for the evidence. Press them on it. Investigate it. And investigate it with a... Well, we're going to look here in just a moment. Because this morning, I want us to go further in what John is calling them to do and us to do. By first of all, you know, what he talks about the call to test. Secondly, uh, exploring that core message that we are to confess. And then thirdly, the hope in which we confess. And so uh, let's talk about the call to test First of all, you know, that where he says here, don't believe every spirit, but test them. And, and several, this, this repeats several New Testament writers who have the same message for the people that they're writing to, especially Paul. Paul writes more than uh, any of the others about testing and putting, uh, putting in trial in effect these teachings that you hear to make sure that they are authentic. Why, here's a sampling. What I'd ask you to do is jot down these verses and, and just the reference and look them up during the week. But here's a sampling from Paul uh, of some of these challenges to test, to explore, to discern, to judge. In Romans chapter 12, he says this, do not be conformed to this world. One paraphrase uh, puts it like this. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Kind of like, don't let the world take you like a a piece of putty or a piece of Play-Doh and, and mold it into a shape that's conducive to the world's thinking. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Be transformed, be changed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Another passage is Ephesians chapter 5 in which Paul writes, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. It's the same word as test. Put it to the test. You're trying to understand God's will uh, for your life. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, he says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more with all knowledge and all discernment, the ability to test, so that you may approve, that is, test, what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. And then a, another passage, and these are just a sampling of the numerous passages that he has. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul writes, do not despise prophecies, that is, words that are delivered from God's word, uh, but test everything. Test everything. Put it to the test. Hold fast what is good. If you're going to hold fast to what is good, what are you doing with the bad stuff? <laughs> Throwing it away. You're getting rid of it. You're not paying attention to it. That's, that's the challenge that Paul gives, and, and a number of other writers have similar challenges, and John is right here. He wants the best for them. He wants them to understand God's will and God's work in their life. And so he says, in order to, to really understand God's will and work in your life, you really have to be testing. Don't listen to everybody that comes along at, at test decide, judge to see what is true or not, uh, apply wisdom to discern what is right or wrong. Now, here's a challenge I hold out to you, that every time somebody stands up here and we're saying, thus saith the Lord, that is, we're saying we're talking 
and, and preaching from God's Word that we are. That if you have a question, you dig. You know, I've had people come up and say, well, you know, my opinion is, or I feel this way. You know, what I really want to hear you say is, Pastor, you know, wow, you know, you made a fantastic point. And, and here's another Bible verse that just really underscores that. Or, ah, Pastor, you know, I think you threw it on the dirt on that one. You know, I, I think you missed the point. Um, because here I look at God's Word and it says this. Can you help me understand it? And we dialogue with God's Word as the basis. Not the latest opinion. Not how we feel about what God's Word says. What does God's Word say? And we interact with it. We engage with it together to understand what he's saying. So I'm just giving you permission. If, if you hear something from up front and you're like, ah, uh, I have a question about it. Well, the, ask the question. And let's explore God's word together to make sure that together we're following Jesus together by listening to what he has revealed in his word, what the spirit teaches through his word. That is our basis. Now, uh, we need to exercise that discernment. We need to be a people who test what we hear. And not just take it all in. Because frankly, nowadays, isn't it the case where we can be easily overwhelmed and literally flooded with messages, right? I mean, and I'm not talking about the Black Friday emails bombarding your email box or all the mailings that you get in your, you know, and these catalogs. Where do these catalogs get our names from? You know, it's like, what on earth is this? You know, it's kind of funny. Uh, I never ask for China. But anyways, um, you, know, all these, all, you know, all these messages that we're getting, and not about Black Friday, but about things of, of substance. And, you know, it's easy to feel overwhelmed, right? I mean, just think about the messages that you've been bombarded with in, in, this, in the past week. Oh, let's put it this way. Let's think about the messages we've bombarded with in the past month. Uh, yeah. What about the past year? What about the past almost two years? Those messages in these past two years have come fast and furious, haven't they? And it's easy to kind of get worked up. And then as soon as you get worked up about one message, one more comes and you get a little more worked up. And, and then another thing comes, and you get a little more worked up. It might be about politics. Hey, I could name a few things, right? And people over there, politics, vaccines, masks. You know, I could name a few things, and people's eyes will get big. You know, veins start to pop out. People's faces start. I haven't even taken a stand. But, the, you know, people are like, <laughs> and they start panting and hyperventilating. And, well, okay, that was me over this past year at times. But maybe not you. Maybe not you. Or maybe you. Have there been those times when you have felt agitated and aggravated and maybe even downright angry? And it's just like, oh! Because it's just like, boom, 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 boom. And, 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 we've, and we get overwhelmed. And those moments though, when we're feeling upset or agitated, it actually presents an awesome opportunity to pause, take a breath, and test my heart, to, to take a look at my heart, to say, what do I truly value? What's the, what's the core on which I'm I'm basic cuz I can ask questions like what's stirring up this response? Uh, why do I feel bent on proving my point at all costs? I've counseled people and 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 myself. I've taken my own advice to take a break from the news and especially social media that can that can be like you just get like that knee jerk, you know, just you see the next post and it's like oh and, and, and the te tendency, the temptation is to react. But the opportunity comes 
when I pause, I take a breath, and I ask myself questions like, ultimately, why do I feel that it's my mission in life to convince this person who's firmly entrenched in their position and sees it as their mission in life to be firmly entrenched, why is it my why do I think it's my life's calling to try to persuade them otherwise? When really I should be testing my own heart and saying, on what is my heart? What is my hope based? Is it based on politicians? Is it based on a medical solution? Is it based even beyond that on, on a relationship? with another person that I'm like staking everything on and that's kind of the core identity of who I am? Or is it a career that, you know, like, hey, who are you? Well, my name is Alan and I happen to define my life because of what I do. And there's plenty of us, we consider our weight and the value of our life attached to, to what we do. And there, and there are so many anchor points that we could we can grab onto, and, and so in those moments when I have to test my heart, I, ha I say, what, uh, what is my hope based? What's the, what is the core? What is the core on which everything else is based? Because if I base it on, on things in the culture, it's going to be different next week, let alone a year from now. If I base my life on the latest trends that are happening around me, there are going to be different trends five years from now or tomorrow. You know, it's just, do you see, do you get my point? What is, what is that core confession that does not change? And that's what John is writing. And so let's take a look at the core to confess. My mother was a, uh, she worked as a bank teller for a number of years. And when she was in her training, she had to learn to distinguish between what is real and authentic and what is fake and counterfeit. And they didn't put before the trainees all these $20 bills or dollar bills or whatever and say, hey, these are all counterfeits and try to learn all the different ways that somebody could counterfeit a bill, though that's good knowledge, I guess, for a banker to have, what, did a, what were they trained in? Not what the copies look like, but what was the authentic one? This is what is authentic. Here are all the telltale signs of an authentic bill, and it was drilled into their heads so that if somebody tried to slip a 20 past my mom at the bank because she knew what the authentic version was, she could spot the counterfeit right away. Again, why? Because she knew all the things about the counterfeit? No, she knew about the real thing. And, and John here is, is pointing to the real thing. He says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, this, by this you know the Spirit of God. Okay, this is how you know Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. The core, the kernel, the thing on which everything else is based, John says, is Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Now, at first, that seems very simple. It seems very straightforward. And frankly, it seems obvious, maybe to most of us in this room. Why? Because, well, we, we already believe that. Jesus Christ came in the flesh, and, and we can feel comfortable in that, and, and maybe going from a point of comfort to even taking it for granted, to, to really understanding the, the power of what that means uh, for you and, and for me. Uh, we, can, we can just kind of almost sing about songs, let's sing a hallelujah, and, and we're thinking about the shopping list for Christmas. Uh, we can be, you know, in the midst of prayer. And like, oh, yeah, 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 that's right, the stockings. I can't forget the stockings. You know, we can be distracted quite easily. And, and, and because it's, 
It's so comfortable. It's the message that we know. Well, if you take it over, if you take a look at church history, over the course of church history, there were a number of times, like what we read here in 1 John, um, I won't get into all the, the depth of it, but there were some really strange teachings that would once in a while bubble up. And, and that happened a lot in, in, in the early church especially. And, and so that's why we have the creeds, like the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the life everlasting. And all God's people said. Now, if you heard that, if you were listening, and I, and I think I got it right. Did I get it all right? For those of you, okay, okay. I, I was like, oh, I think I missed a phrase. But uh, the bulk of it talks about who? Jesus. Because there was that need to say, hey, this is, this is the core. This is who it's all about. This is what we got to be focused on. That's, that's the Nicene Creed, too, and, and any number of the other creeds that have come down uh, in history where there have been that times of saying, we have to refocus back on the core, and that is Jesus Christ who has come in the flesh. Now, this is the first day of Advent, okay? And so it is good to take a moment and unpack what John is saying here. When he said, Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, Jesus, all right? His name that would have been heard in the streets of Jerusalem or in Nazareth would have been Yeshua. Uh, we bring it over, it comes over into English as Jesus, but it's Yeshua. And, and that means the Lord is my salvation, or God saves. It has a couple different variations, but the whole point is God saves. The Lord saves. Christ saves. That, that is, Christ was one who was sent by God. He's the sent one, anointed. He's the Messiah. That's all the meaning of that word Christ. So Jesus, the Lord is my salvation. Christ, the one who was sent, the Messiah, came in the flesh. That is, he was incarnate. All right, to talk about chili con carne, that's chili with meat, right? Incarnate means in the flesh, God in the flesh. And so when we, and that was revolutionary because part of the struggle back then, the way people looked at the, the world was well, the spirit realm is real, and all we see around us, this is all imaginary. This is just fleeting. It's just kind of like shadow. It's here today, gone tomorrow, all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, and so it got very co complicated and convoluted. But for, for John to write, and for Paul to declare, and Peter to declare, and all the apostles and the early church to declare... Jesus Christ incarnate, he came in the flesh, was radical. Because it meant God became one of us. Now when John uses the word confess, it is more than simply agreeing with a statement. You know, to simply agree to the statement, oh yeah, Jesus Christ, he came in the flesh, that's... Well, we celebrate at Christmas time, right? Yep, I, I love some of those Christmas carols. Can't wait to see the little manger scene underneath the Christmas tree. And, and, but, you know, if that's the extent of our belief, well, we're right up there, well, no, we're right down there with the demons. I mean, that's what we read in the Gospels, a number of accounts where the demons said, we know who you are. You are Jesus. You are God in the flesh. 
They believed. Uh, James says, well, it's good that you believe. Guess what? The demons do, and they have sense to shudder when they contemplate God coming to earth, Jesus coming to earth, causes them to shudder at the work of God. That's a, that's a challenge for you and me because we can be comfortable. We can lose that sense of awe at what God has done for us. You see, to confess is a whole life endorsement. To confess reflects a level of belief on which the actions of life, the actions of my life, the actions of your life, are reflected, reflecting that truth. You see, when we say Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that's a statement about God and His work. That is, God took the initiative to come to us. That God came. That's what we're celebrating on December 25th. That God came for you and for me. Because when we say Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that's a statement about you and me. People created in God's image needed saving. I needed saving. You needed Saving. John goes on to say, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil and to save his people. When I declare Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, I'm saying I cannot do it on my own. I can't justify myself before God. But God, in His mercy, in His grace, came in the flesh to do on my behalf what I could not do for myself. So if you take that core confession and you, Jesus Christ came in the flesh, and you hold it up against some popular sentiments. I mean, you're talking to somebody at work, and they say, oh, yeah, you know, Jesus, he was a great moral teacher, wasn't he? He was, he, was, he was really great. had some good stories, encouraged us to love one another, all that kind of stuff. When, how does that measure up against Jesus Christ came in the flesh? You see, right away, we'd say, oh, no. Oh, yeah, he had some good stories that we call parables. He had good messages to love one another, but it goes so much more than that. It's not just, hey, just love one another. It's we love one another because God Almighty loved us first. Right? What about the sentiment that says, you know what, I don't I don't need God's help. Thank you very much. I can do it by myself. I I have a pretty good resume. Because I you know, I'm pretty good. I'm, I mean, certainly not as bad as he is. I'm not pointing at anybody in particular. I'm not as bad as he is. Well, as I've said before, I think as Pastor Carl said last week, when we say, well, I'm not as bad as, I'm also saying I'm not as good. The fact is that in our pride and in our arrogance, we might say, you know, I don't need any help by God or from God. I can do it by myself. Mm. Needs to be a little more self-awareness there about, about really the state of your heart and what you can do for yourself and more importantly, what you cannot do but knowing what God has done. What about you have your truth, I have my truth? Uh, have you heard that one recently? I, I mean, I've heard that. Well, you know, you, you have your truth, and I have my truth. Well, let me put it this way. I may have perceptions and perspectives and points of view and opinions, but are they true? Mm-hmm. 
Some of them probably are. Are they truth? I would say, mm, no, I wouldn't elevate any of those to that level, right? It was Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And there is that basis of the confidence and the hope and the declaration that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. That's the hope in confession. You know, last week, Pastor Carl shared from chapter 3, which declared God is greater than our hearts. God is greater than our self-criticism. His love and His grace and His mercy for us is is greater than our self-justification, our rationalizations, our excuses, and our insecurities. God is greater. And John takes it up a notch and he says, hey, it's even bigger than that. 1 John 4, 4, he says, okay, I'll read it for you. Oh, there we go. Little children... You are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. God is greater than the arguments and the rationalizations that man can create and Satan seeks to stoke. Jesus came in the flesh. And when He came in the flesh, He shattered sin and the bondage of sin. Uh, When Jesus came in the flesh, He broke the power of death. When Jesus came in the flesh, it meant that God was at work and He's at work changing the hearts of people And this is the God who is at work in us today. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. As our worship team comes up to lead us in a song response, many of us can share and testify what God has done through our lives. This this one, this Jesus Christ who came in the flesh, the change that he has brought to our hearts. You know, you could look up and you could declare, this is the one who broke my life from the cycle of addiction. Uh, This is the one who gave me purpose and meaning. This is the one who helped me deal with my inadequacies and my insecurities. And, And I experienced a love that goes beyond comprehension because I realized that God loved me so much that Christ came in the flesh. Jesus Christ came in the flesh to go through what he went through for me. I know if we had an open mic time, any number of us could stand up and say, yes, Jesus Christ came in the flesh, and I can tell you the difference that has made in my life. And, and, and maybe you're here today and and, and, you know, you've been a follower of Jesus Christ for many years. May, may I encourage you to come back to, to 1 John and, and read through it. It's a short letter, but let it speak to your heart and let it move your heart. To be, to be receptive to what God wants to do in your life next. To be soft and sensitive to how he's leading in your, in your life. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. He, God is the one who changes hearts. And he's the one that works through us to do uh, great things. Right? But maybe you're here and maybe you're visiting and whoever you're with, maybe a family member or a friend said, hey, I'm going to church, want to come with me? And you said, well, okay, yeah, I'll come. And so you're here today because you said, yes, you would come. And to you, you know, the picture that I, I like to see, you know, a picture is somebody trying to put the pieces of a puzzle together. Well, you need the box top to put the puzzle together. And what God's word tells us is Jesus Christ came in the flesh 
so that if you are here today wondering, well, who is this Jesus? It's all right here. And I would love to take the time to talk with you about this Jesus. And and maybe today is the day when God is tapping you on the heart and you feel it, you know it. You know, you have your questions, you have your doubts. But you're like, but there's something about this that I feel the need to respond. Because maybe today is the day you say yes to following after Jesus. Maybe today is the day that you say, yes, God, I want to explore, I want to talk, I want to trust in this Jesus Christ who came in the flesh. You know, after the service, I'll be available up front. Uh, The members of the worship team are available, the tech crew serving so well that, you know, you'll see people behind the desk or people walking around serving in the cafe. Any one of us would love to talk with you about Jesus Christ who came in the flesh for you that this might be the day when you say, I will follow after him.